If you live in the real world, you can't do without oil. We use its byproducts every day. But the easy oil has long since been found, and world demand is ever increasing. So now oil companies must scour the ends of the earth to satisfy our thirst for fuel. This program will journey from the Amazonian jungle of Ecuador to the war-scarred savanna of Angola to see what oil does for those countries. Oil could bring blessings to the poor in the developing world. All too often, it's a curse. We are in the tropical rainforest of Ecuador. The men and women of the Warani tribe are going fishing. Moi Inamenga is one of their leaders. He's determined that they should preserve their way of life. Moy believes that oil would be a curse to his people. He fears it will pollute the jungle where he and his tribe have always hunted, gathered and fished. Moy's tribe numbers about 1,500. 53,000 people work for the multinational oil giant formed by the merger of Chevron and Texaco. Headquartered in California, David O'Reilly is chairman of this hundred billion dollar company. Well, I've heard of the curse of oil, and I don't necessarily subscribe to it. The role that oil plays uh, is either a positive one or a negative one because of the way countries are run, not because of the existence of oil itself. On the far side of the Atlantic, on the west coast of Africa, these people are also fishing. They fish as they have for hundreds of years. Portuguese explorers, British and American slavers would recognize this scene in modern Angola. They are hauling in their nets within sight of Chevron Texaco's offshore oil rigs. But this oil wealth has not touched their lives. Today's catch is all they have to live on. The wealth doesn't get distributed to some of the people that uh, could benefit the most or need it the most. And that's clearly an issue for, uh, for our industry and for our company. of Ecuador's tropical rainforest. This is the land of the Quechua people. For most of us, oil means money, and oil makes possible our modern way of life. Try telling that to the Quechua people. Sí, le 
es algo, ¿qué es lo que quiere decir de la contaba nación? Pensando de que... Texaco first struck oil here in 1969. The government of Ecuador may have dreamed that oil would bring wealth to this poor country. But nobody consulted the Amazonian Indians, and it is they who are now paying the price of oil. She also said the stains of feet, the stains of children, the stains of clothes, and, you know, Texaco doesn't give us shoes to wear. I mean, she was saying, this goes into the stream. It makes you dizzy like you're drunk. Before, the water was clean. There were fish, there were animals. We had food to eat, yucca and banana, and we were happy living that way. We thought we would live that way forever, but the arrival of Texaco was very bad. All of the wild animals have gone. We suffer from the smoke, the noise and the fumes now. We can't bear it anymore. We are young and the fumes are making us old. When oil was first discovered in the rainforest region of Ecuador, it looked like the beginning of a beautiful friendship. The current dictator cut the ribbon. An archbishop scattered holy water. When Texaco produced its first barrel of oil, it was like a religious ritual. All too often, oil has failed to bring wealth to developing countries like Ecuador. There's little sign of oil wealth on the streets of Quito, the nation's capital. The question is, how much of this is the legal or moral responsibility of the oil industry? Fernando Villavicencio once worked for the state oil company. Over 30 years of oil production, Ecuador has exported approximately 3,000 million barrels of oil and received $50 billion. With this money, we could have founded a new country. But it is common knowledge that the money just went. The upper classes and the multinationals took all the money. Now there are two countries here, an impoverished Ecuador and a rich Ecuador. Look, look down there. That's Ecuador in poverty. For the next chapter in this story, we headed for Ecuador's border with Colombia. Our destination was a little provincial town called Lago Agrio. It was one of the first places to find oil. Lago Agrio means bitter lake. The sun was setting by the time we reached the outskirts of the town. There's a foreign office advisory for our business travelers and tourists. Avoid this place. Above all, don't go out after dark. The reason is the FARC guerrillas, who control the cocaine trade in southern Colombia. A lot of them go and leave in Lago Agrio. And crime, kidnapping and murder spill over the border. We were glad to pull into our hotel without incident.
Next morning, plane loads of interested parties were converging on Lago Agrio. A potential $6 billion lawsuit against Texaco was about to be heard in the local court. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times and Reuters all sent correspondents to cover the first day of the Texaco trial. Today, it isn't just the world economy, but also public opinion and corporate liability that are being globalized. Cristobal Boniface is the lawyer who 10 years ago filed the lawsuit in New York on behalf of 73 local Ecuadorian plaintiffs. Steven Donziger is an American attorney assisting him on the case. Fundamentally, Texaco came into this country in 1969. And this was a virgin territory, this was pristine rainforest. And they decided not to use the same precautions that are used in the United States to produce oil. Texaco left, 627 open air pits. The ponds are still there, the rivers are still contaminated, the roads are full of oil. It is the worst ecological disaster in the hemisphere. It is. There's nothing like it. What makes this trial echo around the world is that Boniface has won a landmark ruling in a U.S. court. That if the plaintiffs win their case against Texaco and Ecuador, damages will be enforceable in America. It's a hugely important precedent and one that could cost the oil giant billions. No wonder our hotel was overrun with lawyers, lobbyists, ecologists, and reporters. Well, we don't like circumstances such as the uh, Ecuador situation to occur. It's, it's never a good thing to have a dispute going on. Uh, but in this case, we, we're pretty resolute. By early morning on the first day of the trial, the courthouse was already ringed by police. Then just after sunrise, the Texaco team made his appearance. Concerned about their personal safety and the very real threat from kidnappers, they sneaked into the courtroom two hours before anyone else. This is the first time in history that in a giant oil company has had to come to a courthouse in a jungle town in a third world country to answer to charges that it polluted. It's never happened before today. Certainly not in a case of this magnitude, and they have tried to avoid a trial for 10 years. They have spent millions of dollars to prevent us from getting in the courthouse door. Ricardo Vega was helping Texaco's legal team field questions from a not very friendly press. It's uh, easier for trial lawyers uh, to go after companies uh, and attack their reputation and see if they can get, uh, you know, multi-million dollar settlements. We, we feel we have been unfairly uh, accused of something that we need to deal with. So we're going to be direct and, and forceful in asserting our rights. And while it may be unpleasant, it may be uncomfortable, uh, we have no option but to do that. The judge ruled he would visit some of the disputed oil pits, so we decided to take a look for ourselves. Our driver was Jorge Arroyo, who specializes in what he calls taxi tours. The edge of town was crowded with companies that supply the oil industry. At times, the paved road gave way to dirt top. Sometimes they pour oil on the dirt road to create a surface. We finally arrived at a former Texaco facility. When the security guards saw our camera, they stopped us from going any further. So Jorge took us across the road to a little house where Rosa Matango lives with her husband and children. Buenos dias. Rosa, who is one of the plaintiffs in the Texaco trial, 
told us that the oil operations begun by Texaco had polluted her land and made her sick. I am ill. I feel like they are the lion and we are the mice. We are poor and insignificant to them. To get to Rosa's patch of land, you have to go through the oil station. We followed her across the road, but we were not allowed in. So later that afternoon, Rosa took us round to the back of the plant and down the muddy banks of a stream. Heavy rain began to fall. She showed us how oil had soaked into the earth and how it had polluted the water. Crouching down close to the pool water, we could smell the reek of oil. We crossed the stream and got to the other side of the gorge. These are Rosa's pigs. Their backs and sides were covered in oil. Below her land is the main river. The contamination began with Texaco and is now about one meter deep. It is deposited here, where it gathers, before flowing into the river. Evidence of pollution was clear to see in the iridescent colors on the surface of the water. We found Hugo Oreño's house in San Carlos, across the road from what was once a Texaco facility. You have to drive over an oil pipe to get to his home. He used to work for Texaco, but now he says that oil pollution has made him too unwell to work. Estas aguas están bastante contaminadas porque en el tiempo de que Texaco estuvo acá, el... the water is contaminated because when Texaco came, they polluted. There were oil spills on the land and the roads were deliberately covered in oil. So when we used to go to town, our clothes would get covered in oil. I used to work in the southern extraction station. There were no controls. It was Sunday in San Carlos and people were going to church. A medical survey carried out by scientists from the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in London says there's a cancer cluster here. We went to talk with the community nurse, Rosa Mourinho. My father-in-law died in 1989 of cancer of the pancreas. Then, a year and a half later, my own father died of stomach cancer. Then, my aunt died. She was young only 53 years old. It turned out that San Carlos, with a population of 1,500 at the time, had twice as many cancer cases as the Pinchincha main province of Quito. Today, we realize that we are contaminated by the oil companies, especially Texaco, and that they have caused a lot of damage. Texaco denies these charges. There's no indication of any adverse health impact on the residents of the Oriente that can be linked to oil production activities, but they have a very serious problem with, uh, uh, reg with regard to the lack of uh, uh, proper hygiene and proper infrastructure. Uh, and, and we are sympathetic uh, uh, with that, but, but we don't accept that we are responsible for this situation. Amateur video shot 12 years ago shows clear evidence of pollution. But can all this be blamed on Texaco?
This is Sasha Central. It once belonged to Texaco. Today, it is operated by the state oil company, Petro Ecuador. The management could not or would not talk to us, but they did allow us to take pictures of the installation. The plant seemed clean and well managed, but some engineers told us that underinvestment is causing widespread pollution. They showed us machinery that was 30 years old. The firefighting equipment belonged in a museum. But Texaco ceased all operations here in 1992. Until that year, Texaco had been keen to renew its old contracts. Instead, Texaco was in effect nationalized. The government handed all its installations over to the state-owned oil company, Petro Ecuador. It was later agreed that Texaco would spend $40 million cleaning up some of its sites. Ricardo Vega was Texaco's project manager for the cleanup. I spent three years in the jungle and we had a, a certification process on a side-by-side -side base. Everything that they asked us to do, we did it. Petro Ecuador was supposed to assume responsibility for all other sites. We cannot be responsible for things that Petro Ecuador and the government uh, assume full responsibility for the future. One morning, we met up with Judith Kimberling in the jungle town of Coca. Petro Ecuador is supposed to have cleaned up a number of Texaco's old oil pits. Judith Kimmerling was going to take us to see part of that cleanup. We piled into Jorge's pickup truck and headed out into the country. We're going to Comuna San Carlos. This is an indigenous community that's really been very seriously affected by the development that Texaco began and is now continued by Ecuador's national oil company, Petro Ecuador. As we approached the village, we began to see pipelines running along the side of the road. We had arranged to meet people of the community in a large clearing here. Judith Kimmerling has been coming here for a long time. <laughs> Buenos dias. Buenos dias. When she first asked about pollution, nobody knew what she meant. There was no such word in their language. <laughs> Judith Kimmerling teaches law in New York. She's used her professional skills to fight for the Quechua people, and she's made this a personal cause. <laughs> What we had come to see was an oil pit that had originally been dug by Texaco. It was supposed to have been cleaned up by Petro Ecuador after Texaco's contract expired. On the surface, the water looked clean enough. Look, uh, she just stirs it a little bit and you can see that black crude oil from the sediments. And then when they bathe in these waters, they get skin problems. They get spots. Ongos are like mushrooms. Um, some kind of fungus. In the trial, Texaco blames Petro Ecuador for this. No quiere salir. No quiere salir. Estoy contaminada. Como nosotros estás contaminada. Twelve years ago, Kimmerling videoed a Petro Ecuador tractor here. I came to this well, and there was a tractor up on this side, pushing dirt onto the pit. The pit was still covered with a visible cap of crude, and the tractor just pushed dirt over it to cover it and without removing the crude, without doing anything to isolate the contamination from the environment. And that was more than 11 years ago. 
There is still a lot of contamination. We want it all cleared up. This land is useless. Petro Ecuador say they are changing their environmental practices, but admit there are still a few problems. We wanted to get the water analyzed. So before we left, Judith Kimberlin filled two bottles with water from the pond. Did you get the cap? And my hands. <laughs> Jorge drove us back to the local lab in Coca. Juan Haro Alvear supervised the tests for us. Previous results have set a troubling precedent. We have undertaken many experiments to determine the quality of water in this area and we've investigated the overall impact of the oil industry. Of the pollutants we found from oil production, we've detected critical levels of heavy metals like cadmium, nickel, and lead. We have found levels of total hydrocarbons that go way beyond the levels permitted. Our sample also registered dangerous levels of hydrocarbons. When scientists from Harvard School of Public Health carried out tests of their own, they found levels of PAHs, that's polycyclic, aromatic hydrocarbons that were 40,000 times greater than what is recommended by the Environmental Protection Agency in the USA. We were back in Lago Agrio, where the Texaco trial was continuing. Outside the courthouse, things were getting lively. The demonstrators were passionate, colorful, and, this being Latin America, about an hour late. We spotted Rosa Matango in the crowd, and we also saw Rosa Moreno, who runs that clinic in San Carlos. Inside the courthouse, the judge listened for three hours as Texaco's lawyers read out a statement arguing that Texaco's oil pits did not break the laws of Ecuador and caused no substantial pollution. Texaco applied uh, international operational standards prevailing at the time we operated, 60s, 70s and 80s. Pits did not present any lasting environmental problems uh, with regard to uh, impact on people or impact on, uh, on the crops. Vivid, eloquent and passionate, the plaintiff's attorney attacked not only the legal basis but the morality of Texaco's clean-up agreement with Ecuador's government. That agreement frees Texaco from ever being sued by the Ecuadorian government for these damages, but it doesn't free them from being sued by the people who were affected, who had nothing at all to do with the government's decision to make this agreement, which quite frankly astounds me and is against the best interests of its own citizens. The outcome of the trial could change the way oil companies and multinationals operate abroad forever. Because if at the end of this year the plaintiffs do win, they can recover damages in the USA. But in a global economy, world opinion is almost equally important. People sometimes ask me why Chevron Tesco just doesn't settle this. You have protests in your shareholders' meetings. Uh, why you just, you know, settle and get rid of that? We, we can't just settle. It's because our reputation is more important than just uh, getting rid of uh, any uh, political or emotional pressure. 
the only language they truly understand, I have found in my experience, is the language of money and harm to reputation. And if we can expose what they've done to enough people around the world so their reputation is damaged, I believe they will reach a point where they will come to us and say, let's sit down and deal with this problem. Whatever the outcome of the Texaco trial, oil companies are already changing their values because it is no longer enough to simply take care of business. Based in Ecuador, Mark Thurber advises oil companies on the social and environmental impact of their operations. What we've really seen is that the oil companies are operating under a series of new constraints. They have a lot of pressure from indigenous groups, from uh, NGOs, from the banking community, from the Ecuadorian government to operate in a different manner than they operated in the 1970s. And the oil companies that are working here now are very interested in not repeating the mistakes that were made during that decade and trying to reduce their impacts. Texaco is no longer pumping oil from Ecuador. It is merged with Chevron to become Chevron Texaco, the fourth biggest oil company in the world. And the way in which Chevron Texaco conducts its operations shows how oil companies are having to change. By 2015, a quarter of America's oil will come from Africa. Astounding new breakthroughs in deep water technology are making vast amounts of Angola's oil available for the first time. Chevron Texaco is a major player. It recently paid a $300 million signature bonus for the right to exploit one block. Most of the oil lies off Cabinda. Cabinda is an enclave separated from the rest of Angola by a tiny strip of the Congo. Oil was first found here when Angola and Cabinda were part of the Portuguese Empire. The colonialists left 30 years ago, but there's precious little evidence that oil wealth has trickled down to the people since then. Father Congo points out that Angola may have some of the richest oil reserves, but it remains one of Africa's poorest countries. I was recently in Europe, and the first reaction when I said I was from Cabinda was, ah, you're rich over there. And I said, no, we have wealth, but we're not rich. We live in apartheid. On the one hand, there's wealth, and on the other hand, there's 